Good evening. Uh, wake up. Uh, good evening. All right, all right, all right. We are here uh, one more time, uh, the third of, uh, of three lectures. Uh, on Monday night, we heard from Dr. Robert P Pratt, uh, who talked to us about the uh, lesser known figures of the civil rights movement. And just by a show of hands, uh, uh, did anybody learn anything Monday? Just, oh my, oh my. And then uh, last night, uh, we heard from Dr. Stephen Berry, uh, and he introduced us to a little known fellow by the name of Prince Rivers, Prince Rivers, uh, who was the top enlisted man in the United States Colored Troops. Uh, uh, and most of us, dare I say, none of us knew his name before last night. Uh, he played a critical role uh, in leading the U.S. Um, uh, Colored Troops. Um, uh, and what a great discussion we had last night. Tonight, uh, we have a scholar extraordinaire, uh, and uh, he is none other than the Dr. Uh, Sandy Martin, uh, teaches in the religion department at UGA, uh, and he has the distinct pleasure of trying to prod me along uh, as my uh, advisor, as my doctoral advisor. Uh, I uh, reached out to him a couple of months ago and said, Doc, I got something I need you to do. And he said, I'm busy, blood saw, but just for you, this time, this one time, uh, I'll come, I'll come. And I am elated to have him here. Uh, and does everybody have a handout? Everybody have a handout? All right, and we, I see we got a few in the back uh, uh, back there. So uh, I, without further ado, uh, we want to make sure that we give Dr. Martin uh, the time that he needs uh, in order to share with us. Uh, and then we'll have a, a time for question and answer. So without further ado, uh, won't you put your hands together for Dr. Sandy Martin. Good evening. In case this is a flop, remember that um, Dr. Bloodsaw said, scholar extraordinary. So, you know, you just have to go on faith in other words. Good evening. It is certainly a pleasure to be with you uh, to celebrate uh, Black History Month here. And to celebrate Black History Month, sorry. Um, and uh, want to thank Dr. Bloodsaw for the invitation. Uh, one of the great joys of teaching is that you continue to learn so much from those that you are supposedly teaching. And of course, I think I have a, a number of uh, graduate students here tonight or students in the department, including Mr. Abambola in the, in the back there. And so, uh, thank you very much for coming, and, and I forget the, uh, uh, the other student's name, but uh, thank you for coming from the University of Georgia. And I was saying by Dr. Bloodsaw, of course, he comes with a wealth of experience, uh, not only in theological education, but um, also in practical experience, certainly pastoral experience, but just practical experience in community. And you know the story, and so he's just... Uh, it's just a joy to, to, to have you and to, to, to work with you and to learn so much from you. Uh, you, you know, they asked him, said, well, you already got uh, one doctorate. Uh, you sure you want another? Yeah, well, you know, what's the problem with that? Eh? Uh, so we're happy to have him there. Tonight what we want to do, uh, and also let, let me say uh, thank you for my East Friendship brothers and sisters who uh, come out well, the Reverend James Kendrick is pastor. See, I'm a true Baptist, right? Um, thank you so much for uh, coming out tonight and, um, um, you know, supporting Black History Month and supporting me in this endeavor here. I want to talk about the black church in American history and just focus particularly on the rise and impact of black Christianity. Uh, I've got to get better at this PowerPoint thing, so I'll just give you a handout for tonight. What I want to do, if you just look over the handout here, 
you'll see that I'm concerned about three basic things, or this paper kind of focuses on three basic things, identity, institutions, and mission. Uh, identity, institution, and, and mission. And so what we want to look at is the adoption of identity uh, in coming to America, Africans coming to America. We want to look at the emergence and spread of black Christianity. Uh, I could say independent black Christianity, but I really think all of whenever black people embrace Christianity, they operated independently, that it was not simply an imitation taken from uh, other cultures, but it was, they made it their own. And then, of course, we want to talk about the black Christian consensus. This is a, a term that I have uh, phrased uh, to, uh, to uh, and, and so we'll, we'll examine that. If you would flip the page, you will see on the back there a sample bibliography. If you're interested in the study of African-American religious history, uh, of course, uh, you know, Africans, that is to say black people, have been involved with Christianity, as you may know, from the foundations of Christianity, from the biblical period, from the ancient period. And just one book I cite here is Harvey J. Sindema, I guess it's the way you pronounce it, Drums of Redemption, and he gives a look at an introduction to African Christianity. Most of it is focused on Christianity in Africa since the 1500s, but he has a chapter two on there in terms of, of, um, of, uh, in terms of ancient Christianity. And the person we know, Marcus Jerkins, has written a book on Luke and Acts and talking about Black Lives Matter. And in his look at Luke and Acts, uh, that, the way he discusses it, that is also an uh, uh, indication or a demonstration of the presence, the black presence in the earliest days of Christianity. O. Carter G. Woodson, History of the Negro Church, originally published in 1921. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat dated because uh, you don't have much discussion about holiness and Pentecostals and the Church of God in Christ today is at least the second largest denomination, if not the largest black denomination that we have among us and one of the two largest uh, Pentecostal denominations in, in America, uh, you know, whatever uh, uh, color. But his, uh, even though the, the book is somewhat dated 1921. It has a wealth of material in terms of the origins of Christianity in America, the growth of the Christian church in America, and as the date implies, it takes you from the colonial period down to 1921. It's, it's a great work. I'm sure you can find it in libraries or through interlibrary loan or Actually, if you just Google, you might be able to uh, get a, a PDF copy of it from the internet. Uh, Albert J. Roberto, uh Canaan Land is a history of African-American religion in America, rather short uh, book, uh, brief book, about uh, maybe 125 pages or something like that. Uh, but particularly if you, would, you say, I'm not particularly interested in reading all these big uh, tomes on Christian history. If you just want to read something uh, very readable, uh, and and Rabato, the late Rabato now, uh, was a, um, a, a tremendously great scholar. His book, Slave Religion, and it's subtitled something about the invisible institution, also is a very valuable book. Donald G. Matthews, Religion in the Old South, uh, discusses evangelicalism. Uh, particularly up to the Civil War. And what he does, he looks at white evangelicalism, black evangel uh, evangelicalism, and how they interacted with one another and what evangelicalism meant in terms of um, uh, the identity of whites as well as the identity of blacks. Uh, Rita Roberts, her book, Evangelicalism and the Politics of Reform in Northern Black Thought, Great book uh, showing the connection between Christianity and uh, uh, black thought, including protest thought during the pre-Civil War period. Uh, C. Eric Lincoln and Lawrence H. Mamiya, The Black Church and the African American Experience. C. Eric Lincoln, a great sociologist. Uh, what they do is give a 
contemporary portrait of the black church. Uh, this book uh, was released, I believe, in the early 90s. And so as of the 1980s, early 90s, gives a good portrait. And, and that's where uh, you can see the major black denominations outlined uh, and, and, and discussed. Um, Leroy Fitz, History of Black Baptists. Uh, great text, uh, uh, I think uh, 1985, uh, and really giving a history of black Baptists on up to the uh, present day. You know, if, if you uh, meet an AME, African Methodist Episcopal uh, Church person, and you say, who is Richard Allen? Uh, of course I know who Richard Allen is, and they can talk about Richard Allen. Uh, but a lot of us Baptists, if you say, who is Andrew Bryan? Andrew Bryan, yeah, I think I know him. Doesn't he live down the street down there? Uh, hasn't connected that with the first African Baptist church back in the 1700s, one of our earliest um, churches that were founded. Milton C. Sarnett, African American Religious History, is a good document, a collected, uh, a document, uh, a good text of collected documents on African American religious history from the colonial time to the present, a great resource there. Uh, and if you're interested in, in uh, black Baptists and African missions, and the point here is to say, blacks have not only been focused, black Christians, on Christianity in the United States of America, but also on the global stage. And there you see that going back to the earliest days of the Republic, back in the 1820s, you see, um, uh, black Americans expressing interest in Africa, sometimes uh, combined with uh, colonial, uh, co uh, colonization in Africa. Some people would say it's colonialism. But at any rate, let's uh, flip the page and go down here. The rise of new black identities, and I'm really kind of using the language here of Rita Roberts in her book, Evangelicalism, that's uh, listed on the back. It's in, we're talking about the colonial period here now. We are talking about the forced migration of uh, blacks from Africa to America. And what she says in that book and what others of course have said, I just kind of like the way she phrases it, she notes three important transitions that occur um, regarding African or black people as they move from Africa to the Americas. For one thing, uh, our ancestors started off as ethnics in Africa, but in America they became Africans in America. From ethnics in Africa to Africans in America. In Africa, various ethnic groups, or we used to call them tribal groups and what have you, various ethnicities, that was paramount one's own ethnicity, people's own ethnicity. But in America, particularly in North America, the importance of individual, I should say, well, the importance in terms of identification of different ethnic groups was of less importance. Because whether we were Yoruba, whether we were Kikuyu, since that's East Africa, I'm just naming some, Zulu, unlikely, but I'm just naming groups. Whatever we were in Africa, however we identified uh, in Africa, in the United States, we were all Africans. Sometimes, uh, in, when you talk about the 1600s and the 1700s, um, we are identified as Africans, Ethiopians sometimes, and particularly in the naming of institutions and what have you in groups, sometimes Abyssinian, which of course is another name for Ethiopia. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in uh, New York City, but I'm sure there are others around as well. I think there's an Abyssinian Presbyterian Church uh, somewhere. Um, this is what happened. This is a significant change in identity from a focus on ethnicity to a, to a focus on race, we might say, uh, the African race and African people. Now, in Brazil, for example, in much of Latin America, is somewhat different. Uh, we are still Africans there. Europeans generally define Africans are people apart, and 
the same people apart regardless of, of uh, ethnicity. But in Brazil, ethnicity meant more than it meant in North America, particularly in Anglo-North America, uh, U.S. and Canada. And then what another transition that happened is that we moved from Africans to Americans. Well, we never really ceased being uh, Africans, but we also became Americans. Maybe that should be from Africans to Africans and Americans. Uh, in other words, the longer we remain here, the more we embrace, of course, the language, religion, culture, and what have you of uh, what would become the United States of America. And then we move from African religions to Christianity. And uh, Mr. Abambola, before you uh, uh, don't take, uh, when, you, when you talk to Dr. Derry Bigby, make sure I, I add this as, uh, that you add this as well, that, that, that I added it in the talk here. Dr. Derry Bigby, uh, renowned scholar of African religion, says that really African religion is one. Uh, it's, it's in different expressions like Christianity, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholics, and Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, but it's one religion, Christianity. And so he says the same is true of African religions. You can speak of African religions in terms of the different expressions. But his argument is there are uh, elements that are held in common across ethnic lines, across those sub-religious lines. So you speak of one African religion. I have African religions here because I'm not only talking about African traditional religion, uh, but also about Islam. Now, the overwhelming vast uh, uh, number of people coming to America were from the uh, traditional African religion, or, well, traditional African religion. But about anywhere in terms of the, of, of the people brought into the Americas, I think it's estimated anywhere from 6% to around 24% came from mainly Islamic lands. Uh, now, when you come from an, a mainly Islamic land, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily Islamic. But then again, if you come from a land that's not mainly Islamic, it doesn't mean that you're not Islamic. So I think it all balances out there. Um, so the estimates range. Uh, I think a good conservative, uh, reasonable position is to say at least 10 to 15 percent of Africans brought into the country were Islamic, uh, come out of the, is, uh, the Islamic tradition. Um, now, what's the estimate of number of people brought to America? Uh, I've seen estimates from 11 million to 15 million, uh, and I guess this is not counting the numbers who died along the way in the so-called Middle Passage, the number of people who died as a result of slave raids there in uh, the home continent of Africa there and what have you, but in terms of the people who actually set foot in the Americas alive, um, anywhere from, from 11 to 15 percent, it's only an estimate. And so when you say that there may have been at least 10 percent of them were Islamic, that's a whole 10 percent of 10 millions, that's at least one million people, so anywhere from one to two million people were uh, Islamic, and, um, and what we have, of course, in North America, when I say here, from African religions to Christianity, for the most part, Christianity, overwhelmingly uh, part, Christianity is gonna triumph in terms of numbers. Uh, why is it that the African traditional religions and, the, and Islam do not survive in, Af uh, in, in America uh, on a widespread scale. You have examples here and there, but on a widespread scale, in a systematic sense. Uh, there are a number of theories put forth, and again, Rabato and slave religion and some of these other texts will give some reasons. Um, it's, they survive stronger, both Islam and African religions survive stronger, say, in Brazil. So what does Brazil have? Some would say 
for one thing, the people who were forcibly settled in Brazil, African people, were generally settled according to their ethnic groups, that the integrity of the ethnic group held there. Whereas in North America, US and Canada, we were basically just kind of uh, deliberately, it was kind of deliberately mixed in the various ethnic groups. And there's a reason behind that. The argument is if you just mix them in, they will have more difficulty communicating with one another, and therefore you have less likelihood of rebellions. Of course, there were rebellions uh, anyway, but then they would say that you know, there have been even more. In Brazil, uh, well, they're not interested in rebellion either. I mean, they want to stamp, stamp down uh, rebellion as well. But the philosophy there is, no, if you continue to separate the groups, you encourage rivalry between the groups, kind of divide and conquer. So there was two different philosophies. But now what does all this have to do with, with Christianity or with uh, African religion sustaining? You can imagine that a religion will survive the most if it's among people who share that religion and the same perspective of that religion as opposed to being in another land, uh, using another language, and you're not able to, sh to communicate with one another. Uh, also, the ratio of blacks to white, uh, that is another good indication when a religion, African religions and Islam, for that matter, in South America would survive. The ratio, there were in many areas, far more blacks, um, uh, versus whites in terms of numbers, and, and particularly in certain areas um, of the uh, uh, of, of certain regions there. Now, in the U.S., on in, in the coast, in Carolina coast, Georgia coast, or what have you, you have the same pattern in certain areas of our country. You have a greater ratio of blacks to whites, and that's where you see the strongest presence of what we may call African retentions, um, you know, aspects of the African religion, even if it's not the whole system, you have stronger elements surviving on the sea islands, the, the, the coast. And that's where we see more evidence of individuals and families and maybe here and there, maybe even a couple of communities maintaining Islam, again, on the coast. Not so much in West Georgia, but in East Coast uh, Georgia. Um, so, identity. These are the three things that happen to Africans in America. They move from ethnics in Africa to Africans in America, meaning the ethnic lines were reduced and we were just one people, so to speak. Then from Africans to Africans in America, become more Americanized, of course, and then move to Christianity. Now, in talking about Christianity, uh, Roman numeral three here, in the US, notice point A here, black Christianity in the ancient world in sub-Saharan Africa, we've touched on that already, bear that in mind. But again, where you, whereas you may have had traces, uh, trace numbers of Africans who were Christians, uh, for the most part, overwhelming, you know, you had very few, uh, very few uh, individuals, or, 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 you know, a, a small number. Uh, as I said before, mainly it was traditional African religion and Islam. Although it bears notice, uh, or notation, I should say, that the kingdom of the Congo, somewhere around the 1400s, uh, when Portugal, you know, that Portugal was one of the first European countries to engage on this uh, era of colonization and uh, conquest and what have you. Uh, and uh, Portugal made contact with various parts of Africa, but certainly with uh, West Africa as well. And as a result, uh, the kingdom of the, of, of the Congo, kind of West Central Africa, adopted Christianity as the state religion. It wasn't forced upon them, 
um, they adopted it. And it survived, I guess, as a state religion for about uh, 100 years. That doesn't mean that most of the people were Christians, but it, it, it meant that you certainly, you know, it, it was, the state was operated, uh, you know, according to, um, from a Christian perspective and what have you. And it is argued that some of those Christians were caught up in the slave trade, but again, you're still talking about small numbers of people. But when we talk about black Christians in colonial America from the, you know, as early as the 1600s, of course, you have blacks in America converting to Christianity. Now, let us dispel a myth and affirm a reality here. We have a myth that black people embraced Christianity because they were forced to do so, that we were forced to abandon the practice of, Christ, of, of, of uh, African religions, forced to abandon the practice of uh, Islam. Um, I'm, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of people. You can't say that never happened anywhere. But by and large, that's not the case. For one thing, and this may be hard to believe here, Europeans were not particularly interested in missionizing or Christianizing black people. There was a battle, so to speak, among them, an argument, a debate among them. That's not quite the right word at any rate, but there's a struggle that, the, that those missionaries who wanted to convert blacks to the faith uh, that they had. Uh, uh, some of the missionaries would say, if we convert them to Christianity, they will accept slavery as a God-ordained institution, and they'll be better slaves. The slaveholders said, I don't know about that. And, and, and that continued, even into the 1800s up to the Civil War. There were always slaveholders who said, I don't know about that. There were slaveholders, like uh, Charles C. Jones uh, in Liberty County, Georgia, who did propagate Christianity as a means of making blacks submissive. But even Charles C. Jones said he was preaching once. Uh, he was a Presbyterian. He was preaching once in Liberty County there. And he went to that part of scripture uh, you know, uh, scriptures that says slaves obey your master and so forth and so on. And people got up, black folks, he is a slaveholder now, a white man, <laughs> and these are black people he's speaking to in a slave society. They get up and start walking out when he starts quoting from the Bible or citing the Bible uh, in terms of slaves obey your master. Some stay, you know, many stayed and they came up to him and said, why are you talking like that? That's not in the Bible. He could not persuade them that that was in the Bible because they, that didn't register to them that a good all-powerful, a loving God would condone something like slavery. And they had difficulty. And I cite that example to, to, to show that he's not the only one who had that experience. And back in the 1600s, uh, uh, Francis Lejeune, a uh, missionary on the Carolina frontier, was saying uh, he, he's preaching and he's appealing to the slaveholders, white slaveholders, Please let the slaves hear the gospel and so forth and so on and what have you. And he talks about success he's had. And he said, now, let me explain it to you, <laughs> you who are slaves. Now, when, when you accept Christianity, that doesn't mean you're going to be free. Now, you're not, please don't join the church with the idea that you're going to be free. A whole lot of them join the church with the idea that they're going to be free, whether Jones said it or not. And Jones talks about, uh, not Jones, uh, Lejeune. Lejeune talks about how people, how uh, 
black people were adopting their own version of Christianity. For him, it was heresy. They were interpreting Christianity in the sense of Christianity means freedom. And of course, there were a number of slave revolts and Christians were sometimes leaders in that. Remember Emmanuel Church over in um, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, back in the day of the Denmark Vesey uh, revolt. Uh, well, it didn't come to be a revolt, but um, a plot for a revolt. Uh, it is, uh, later on he would become a bishop in the church. I, um, um, Morris Brown, uh, college named after him, Morris Brown uh, was rumored to be involved in that plot. There was also African specialist, religious specialist, also involved in that. Point is that there was reluctance to evangelize simply because it was understood that uh, people are going to interpret Christianity in different ways. And blacks are going to interpret it from the perspective of slaveholders and others in a, in a way that talks about the liberation from bondage. Um, moving on, let's get to some independent or autonomous black churches. Churches that were organized specifically for black people. And most of these are organized by black people for black people. Uh, there is a church up in uh, Virginia that uh, is often cited as the earliest um, record that we have of an independent black church. I think it was named first African um, uh, uh, church in the beginning and then it, it took another name and uh, there's not as much documentation for that church. Much more documentation for the Civil Bluff Baptist Church across the river from Augusta, uh, Georgia. And there still is a Civil Bluff Baptist Church there. Uh, this church was founded in the 1770s, somewhere between maybe 1773 and 1775. That's when it's organized. And as we know, sometimes churches, well, churches exist sometimes quite long before they are officially organized. Depends upon how you define church. If you define church as people getting together, serving the Lord and sharing with one another and communicating with one another, there's a, shall we say, a pre-organization stage prior to the people actually establishing the church. But the church was established Silver Bluff there. Across the river in Augusta, what will become known as the Springfield Baptist Church. I think originally that church was named something like First African Baptist Church, but it changed its name to Springfield Baptist Church. And I believe there are those who say, no, this really is the oldest church because what happened, the Civil Bluff congregation moved across the river. The, the, the Revolutionary War is going on during this time and churches black and white are being disrupted, okay? And so this church was also disrupted. And it is said that some went over to Augusta and founded what we know today as the Springfield Baptist Church. Others said, no, no, uh, you know, yeah, that may have also been the case, but the original Civil Bluff people stayed in that area and, and brought the church up again. Some of them went down to Savannah, Georgia, George Lyle, David George, um, I think Jesse Peters went over to Augusta, but later he came down to Savannah to assist with an organization of a church there. Now there was preaching going on there in a community of the faithful prior to the start of the first African Baptist Church. It was organized in 1788. Shall we say it was regularized. There was already a community going on before it was regularized. Um, and it seems that there was a community of, even uh, going back to the 1770s, maybe the 1760s, there was some preaching going on uh, by people from the Silver Bluff area and also from areas of um, other parts of South Carolina coming down uh, to, to Savannah as well. But at any rate, 
the Civil Bluff Baptist Church, Greenfield Baptist Church, First African, and First Bryan Baptist Churches are among the oldest uh, churches we have. It seems that the first independent black congregations started in the South among Baptists. The first independent denominations appear to have begun in the, in the North and uh, among the Methodist. So you have uh, the Union Church of Africans. Somebody who's AME is, is going to start throwing bricks at me. What do you mean? Uh, according to Lewis V. Baldwin, oh, I didn't have him on here. According to Lewis V. Baldwin in a study that he did, the Union Church of Africans is really the oldest black denomination in terms of at least aspiring to be a denomination. It has always remained rather small in numbers compared to the Methodists and you know, other churches as well. And it has also been mainly confined to the mid-Atlantic area. We're talking here about um, Maryland, in the area of Maryland, Pennsylvania, but especially Maryland. But as early as around 1813, you have a denomination started, uh, Union Church of Africa. Um, one of the main leaders was Peter Spencer. Spencer spelled with a C. Uh, but the one we know about and the one that, you know, we may say made the greatest impact, splash, or what have you, is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, the, the congregation started earlier but the denomination itself came together in 1816 in Pennsylvania. African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, um, somewhere around 1821, it came together as an independent black denomination uh, uh, based in, at that point, New York. So you have one in Philadelphia, another one in New York City. Uh, very similar, as a matter of fact, in the beginning, they both were called African Methodist Episcopal Church. It's not until 1848 that the uh, Zionites add the term Zion to their title. What's the difference between them? Not a whole lot, but it appears that the Zionites gave more freedom, so to speak, to lay people, to non-clergy people. They were they they did not support the bishopric, uh, the office of bishop as strong as say the AME. Um, as a matter of fact, that's one reason why they didn't become part of the AME. They didn't know we don't want Brother Allen. He's a little too, you know, we, you know we disagree with him. Uh, and in the beginning, the AME Zion Church elected their bishop or re-elected him every four years and often called him superintendent as opposed to calling him bishop, sometimes bishop, but um, very often superintendent. What does that say? They were kind of leery of bishops exercising too much power. Comes the Civil War and the churches are spreading in the South, getting members, and some people saying in so many words, the AME Zions are not real Methodists. You know, they don't really have bishops and what have you. And so they tighten up things there and say, we're going to elect bishops for life. Then later on, of course, they'll have a retirement age. Um, and, you know, not every four years. Ah, I, you may say, I'm not, you, you're getting bogged down too much in that. Uh, what about the Baptists? What about the Baptists? <clears throat> the closest you have to a um, national denomination is the American Baptist Missionary Convention founded in 1840. I think it was founded at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Uh, you had other associations, Wood River Baptist Association over in Illinois in the 1830s. Um, and there are others in there as well. The Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, founded in 1870. Um, in 1844, the Methodist Episcopal Church which we know mainly today as the United Methodist Church, divided uh, basically into North and South. And it was over the issue of slavery. But there were a whole lot of black people in both. As a matter of fact, 
most black people didn't leave the predominantly white churches or the white denominations and join the AME and the AME Zion. Most of them stayed with the, with, with, with the mother church. So there are a whole lot of blacks still in the Southern Methodist Church. In 1870, they form a separate group known first as the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, later as the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, I think in 1954. Um, National Baptist Convention formed in 1895. At long last, the Baptists form a convention that continues, um, you know, it doesn't disappear, it continues over, well up to the present day. Um, that convention itself will split around 1915, 1916 into two groups, the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, and the National Baptist Convention of America. I won't go into details on why all of that happened, but they split. Um, notice I ease in here, Church of God in Christ, among these Baptists here. It's because they, they were organized also in the 1890s, 1897, as a holiness group, and then reorganized in 1907, um, more along the Pentecostal lines. Pentecostals, of course, place greater emphasis on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues or other languages, divine healing, um, a prophecy, and what have you. Not that you couldn't find that among holiness as well. So that's why they are often spoken of as the holiness Pentecostal traditions, because they really kind of overlap there. But the, the Church of God in Christ, founded by C.H. Mason, um, the national, uh, we talked about that. Later on in 1960s, the Progressive National Baptist Convention would appear. And these in italics here, these are your major black denominations. AME, AME Zion, CME, NBC One, NBC Two, um, and uh, Progressive National Baptist. Those are your, and of course, Koji, uh, Church of God in Christ. Okay, my time is running short here, right? E there, black Christianity and the invisible institution. The invisible institution is a phrase that refers to all of those religious activities of the people who are enslaved. All of those activities that are not visible to whites or not as visible to whites. So when you talk about secret meetings, uh, uh, because there were some people who said, we don't want to worship. Uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll worship with whites, but we also want our own worship. Um, we want to be a bit more expressive in our worship than, um, than, the, uh, than, than the whites are. And in those days, of course, whites were quite expressive uh, as well. Um, and we also don't want to hear all of this about slaves obey your master. We want to pray for freedom. Okay. Uh, we want to talk more about the Exodus experience and uh, what Meshach, uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and what that has to do with us as free people. So they would meet in secret. And this was not a safe thing to do. Because you can imagine slaveholders and others are saying, for all we know, they're down there trying to form in a revolution. Uh, but even, even, even when they weren't afraid of rebellion, very often slaveholders and others were afraid of black people praying for freedom. You know, you would think, well, so let them pray. What's the big deal? The, 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 the Christian slaveholders and their supporters believed in prayer. They believed prayer could be effectual. And, 
you know, a, a preacher who kind of just up there preaching, and the next thing you know, he's talking about, yes, all of God's children are going to be free. Oh, you know, you had to kind of bring him down. So meeting in secret to pray the way they want to pray, to sing the way, they, to worship the fellowship the way they want to worship. And there were other activities that went on also um, that were not shared with whites as openly. This is what is known as the invisible institution. See, that's why I say that all of black Christianity, in a sense, is independent black Christianity. Because though it may not be outwardly organized and you have a certificate from the local um, association saying you are a church, they are still meeting as a church and they are having a parallel invisible institution to the organizer of uh, uh, official institution. And now finally, to the, to the, to the, to the last um, thing here, the black Christian consensus. I argue, and, and, and really, it's, I'm just really kind of rephrasing what others have said already, so, you know. But my terminology is, there has been in this country a black Christian consensus. And I mean a number of things by that. Uh, the obvious fact is that most religious people in America are Christians. Most black religious people are Christians. Um, especially what we would call evangelical Christians. You may want to be careful. You want to hold on to evangelicals. You don't want that term to just kind of pass out and belong totally to other people. Uh, you want to hold on to that. Evangelical means an emphasis on a born-again experience, and people, you know, uh, describe that in different ways. It may be something dramatic. It may be just simply making up one's mind and heart. But, but however you describe it, a born-again experience, an emphasis on evangelism, reaching out and bringing others in, uh, whether one is a missionary or a minister, or whether one is just um, a layperson who shares the faith with others, who uh, communicate. There's a belief in that, a belief in reading the Bible, a belief in personal devotion. I'm not saying we always do these things, but we believe in them, right? And sometimes we actually do some of them, right? Uh, this is evangelicalism. So you're talking about mainly Baptists, Methodists, and in those days, in the 1800s, uh, 1700s, 1800s, uh, Presbyterians, um, Congregationalists, where some Congregationalists where you uh, could find them in the South, but, but they were in the North, of course. So the black Christian consensus is that most black people have reached the consensus, the general agreement, that Christianity is our religion, and especially evangelical uh, Christianity, but not only that. You have black Catholics, you have black Lutherans, you have black Mormons, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, it's across, you know, uh, across the gamut there, but especially Baptist, Methodist, and Holiness Pentecostals. Um, Christianity is the predominant religion, but I'm also, but also, it's the dominant worldview of the Christian community. And that's what I like about that Rita Roberts book. She is not necessarily writing it from a theological perspective. She's writing it as a historian. And in writing about it as a historian, uh, a secular historian, if you will, not, not necessarily a religious historian, she's talking about how evangelical Christianity impacts northern black protest. And for that matter, you could say southern black protest as well. What do you mean by protest? Condemnation of slavery. Support for uh, the Underground Railroad. Uh, support for holding national Negro conventions, as they were called, to deal with issues uh, you know, uh, uh, with which the race uh, uh, dealt with. And of course, number one, that would be slavery. 
And remember, most people in the North during the 1800s before the Civil War uh, were intimately connected in some way to their black brothers and sisters who were held as slaves. Many of them had been slaves themselves. G uh, Germaine Logan in the AME Zion Church uh, escaped slavery, I think, in, uh, from Kentucky. He, he wrote this article, and they were coming after him, and they're going to take him back into slavery, and he said, let him come on. He's up in Rochester, New York. Uh, he wrote a piece called, I Will Not Live a Slave. If they come for me, they'll find me, and uh, I'm ready to, to take them out if necessary. And they said, well, we can buy your freedom. We can go to your slaveholder and buy your freedom. What about that? He said, no, my freedom comes from God. I will not purchase my freedom because that is to concede that the slaveholder has a right over me and my freedom comes from God. Uh, and he, is, he was an AME Zion minister, right? And so um, religion affected much of black protest thought. Um, the goal of black Christian consensus Laboring for God and the race. You find that, I think, in all of our organizations, Methodists, Baptists, Holiness, Pentecostals. You find that idea that we embrace Christianity not only for spiritual salvation, so to speak, not only for comfort, spiritual comfort in this world, not only for eternal life, but we embrace Christianity because it is a powerful tool to achieve justice in this life. Our ancestors held in slavery, many of them, particularly those who were Christian, firmly believed that slavery was coming to an end. They just knew it. They could not accept the idea that a good God, all-powerful God, would permit this to go on forever. In the early 1800s, there was a, a minister who, Nathaniel Paul, I believe, a Baptist minister up in New York, he raised the question. Um, he said, he, he's writing and he's saying, the question comes to me, why does the Lord permit all of this slavery to continue? You know, why doesn't the Lord step in? And he said, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing him, if I believed it was always going to be like this, that at no point was God going to intervene, then I would renounce my faith. You get what he's saying there. To be a Christian is to believe in liberation. It may take a time, but it's going to happen. And it's today, I don't think we fully appreciate what emancipation, emancipation proclamation, the victory of the Union um, Army and the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. I don't think we appreciate how much those people saw that as an exodus experience. You know exodus from the Bible, right? Go down Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. God acts in history. How do we know who God is? By how God acts in history. And God acts in history on behalf of the oppressed. We don't fully appreciate that for our ancestors uh, coming out of, the, out of slavery, the Civil War, that they saw this as God's intervention in history. Yeah, they knew people were fighting and dying, and they knew everybody fighting for the Union Army wasn't necessarily their friends and all. They understood all of that. But God moves in mysterious ways God's wonders to perform. They saw God acting in that. Hence, you had jubilee celebrations. And what is jubilee? Taken from the Old Testament, where people are celebrating their freedom every seven years, uh, the slave, the Hebrew slaves were to be set at liberty and to have jubilee. And they were saying, this is our jubilee. And 
even as you get you know on with the post reconstruction period and all of these things are being taken from uh, black people uh, most black people who were voting prior to that lost the right to vote especially in the south but even then they could look back and say in the year 1900 a whole lot more of us can read and write than we did before uh, we may be sharecroppers and we don't have you know, we may be, maybe we're being cheated out of our money, our fair share. But when we were chattel slaves, when we were held as slaves, we weren't getting any money at all. So even though those dark days, so to speak, were coming, they could still see that as God's acting in history to liberate them. I've gone on too far too long, and I, hear I, I stop. Would you like to add anything? Uh, am I out of order here? Uh, do, do you have any... Um, 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 thing you'd like to add, any questions, anything you'd like to take issue with. Uh, some of you may have heard this before. I'm going to briefly modify it. You can disagree with everything I said and you're still my brother and sister. Attach in front of that whatever you want. Uh, Christian brother and sister, religious brother and sister, soul brother and sister, anything. So, uh, folks are always disagreeing with me, so don't, don't, don't have a, don't, don't, don't. Any, any, um, uh, Mr. Abambola, Olafemi Paul Abambola, said, come to the, um, uh, mic there. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is this. In spite of the spread of African-American church, what do you think is the future of African-American church in the next millennium? Millennium? Yes, sir. You mean like 1,000 years? Yes. Man. <laughs> 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 Can we reduce that to 100 years or maybe, or 50 years? Uh, anyway. yeah. wow. You know, I was, um, for some times I've kind of been a little worried about uh, whether well, church in general is surviving, Christianity in general is surviving, especially the institutional Christianity. And that includes the black church. I think that and, and one of my, you know, the idea here is that if, if Christianity has been that which has most shaped us as a black community, what happens if we lose it? What comes into place of that? Uh, those from the Islamic tradition, the Buddhist tradition, uh, whatever tradition, they make critiques of Christianity, and many of us hear that, and we say, that's right. But they don't become Muslims. They don't become Buddhists. They just kind of out there. So what happens if we lose the church? Will we, how is that going to affect us in terms of our struggles for greater equality and what have you? But I was reading an article maybe uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a week or so ago, and the article was written by people who were, not so much written by people, but it was interviewing people, some of whom had been alienated from the church, particularly the black church, talking the black church here. And some of those people alienated from the church we're saying things like this. When I talk to people and they're thinking about leaving the church, you know, we say to them, you're really going to have to make an adjustment because maybe you don't realize how much the, the church is a part and Christianity is a part of who you are. 
Well, first of all, you stop going to church, you lose community. You lose community. Um, people sitting there just walking up talking about they're going to pray for you. Well, you may not believe in prayer, but at least you got somebody saying, I am concerned about you. And based on my beliefs, I'm willing to pray for you. I'm eager to pray for you. Um, you lose community. Uh, I would argue you lose an identity. And, and these people were saying this. These are people who kind of alienated from the church saying, what are we going to do about our identity? How do we define who we are? Because so much of it is wrapped up in our identity as Christians, specifically as Christians. Uh, and uh, Mr. Abambola, that kind of gave me a... That kind of relieved my mind in a sense because it, it says, okay, all right, when we make these cases about the church is important, the church has been central, there are people who, even people who don't like the church, so to speak, who are, with, who are ready to say, yeah, that's right, and, oh boy. If we can get them to say, yes, that, that's right, then maybe you ought to come back to the church. Or if you don't like this church, maybe you ought to uh, fashion another church. Um, so I guess I'm thinking in the next 50 or 100 years that there will be at least a vigorous minority of people who will hold on to the church and that that will make a difference. Um, much of that may just be wishful thinking on my part, but uh, of course, I, you know, I, I don't think the church is gonna disappear up on this rock, I'll build my church and um, of course, you have to be careful with that. Uh, he said his church wouldn't disappear. He didn't say it wouldn't disappear there. <laughs> so in, in, in parts of the world, the churches have disappeared there, even though they're somewhere else. But I, I think it's going to stay here because I think it's just so much part of who we are. Though things may get a little rough. Um, I sh before you left, I should have asked you what you thought about it. And I guess I still, and anybody else, so. Senor Reverend Sheets, president of NAACP and so forth. Good afternoon, <laughs> sir. Thank you so much for uh, preparing this presentation. Uh, two questions. One, can you elaborate at all on, on the slave Bible? It's my understanding, understanding that there were Bibles that were uh, prepared especially for slaves with, with uh, certain certain books left out uh, for, uh, for the slaves worship if you will and the, the other thing is what, what would be your thoughts on our moral compass today because the, the because of the lack of attendance in churches many of our families are not going to churches now so now we see a, de a demise in our moral compass if you will okay stay right there stay right there. <laughs> um I don't know much about, uh, you know, a slave Bible that was fashioned particularly for black people because I, I think in most instances, in terms of slavery, they didn't want black folks reading anyway. Uh, so it wasn't so much a Bible. It might have been, but I'm not as acquainted with that. What I am more acquainted with is what they call slave catechisms where you took certain portions out of the Bible and certain creeds and uh, doctrinal statements and you fashion it for those who are slave. Uh, who made you God? What did he made you for to be a slave? You know, And so you did have those. Um, and mainly that was more sort of in, to some extent, you know, among Methodists and whatever when they were trying to missionize, uh, you know, the slaves in, in the slave cabins and what have you. But for the most part, your Baptists and Methodists 
didn't rely on catechisms as much. They relied more on revivals. And I think that's one reason why so many uh, black people embraced Baptist, Methodist, and in those days, Presbyterians and others, because they were placing the people, so to speak, or presenting God directly to the people as opposed to through a catechism. Now, there is another slave Bible, however, and that's the Bible of the enslaved themselves. And while they, in many instances, could not read and write, they had scriptures in their minds that constituted the Bible for them. The Exodus about Moses uh, mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, what are some of those other? Uh, 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 Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel in the lion's den. And on coming on over to the New Testament, Paul and Silas uh, in prison. Of course, Christ being born. Uh, and of course, uh, we had our hymnology, uh, Sister. Bellinger can tell us more about that. We had our hymns and, 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 and our spirituals that we created. And if you would say, you see them as being the Psalms of the Bible. You know, there's a book of Psalms in the Bible, right? So um, I think that's what impacted those who were enslaved more. That Bible that they took, uh, their scholars call that a canon within a canon. Those are the the, the Bible within the Bible that they took in, and that's what they lived by. Uh, moral status or what have you, I, um, I'm going to go way out on a limb here. Is that door open there? Can I get out of there? Um, I think some religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, some religion is vital for the maintenance of morality. Uh, and when we're talking about morality here, you know, none of us is perfect, right? We're all, you know, uh, flawed and what have you and fallen short. So this is, I don't mean this come across self-righteous or anything. But we do have, however flawed we are, we do have norms, values, standards that we say this is right. And so when we fall, we know, put it like this, when we get lost, we, we know, uh, or when we go down the wrong road, we know, well, I need to kind of turn here and get back to the right road. Um, I think religion is vital to the maintenance of morality. I think an individual from time to time can live moral without a religion. But I think when you talk about a community of people, whether it's black people, white people, um, Hispanics, Latinos, whether it's the nation as a whole, I, I think if you don't have organized religion, institutional religion, you're in danger. That's what do you think? Well, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Very plainly, from my observation and exposure to young people, especially those who are not church, they operate in a mindset of no conscience. They do things without fearing anything other than man. And a person that does not have a conscience is a dangerous person. And we raise up, when we raise up a society that does not have a moral compass, as you said, we need religion in whatever faction it comes, to give our youth some guidance and direction. As a child, a gleaner, I learned the Ten Commandments. And I learned that it was wrong for me to take that slingshot and kill that bird if I wasn't going to eat it. And that also transcends your killing unnecessarily in life. And now we have a, a spiraling downward in our society, and, if, and everybody sees it in the news, that our young people are somewhat unbridled. They, they seem to have lost their moral direction, their compass. They're, they're, they're so disrespectful right now, it's, it's unreal. Uh, 
prime example, I was in Walgreens a few nights ago, and this young lady was dissing, as the young people say, just being totally disrespectful to her grandmother, talking to another girl on the phone because the grandmother had a, a Christian foundation. And she did not appreciate her grandmother giving her the guidance or correction that grandmother had been giving her. And some of the words she was using speaking about her grandmother, I wouldn't talk about my dog that way. But this child was going on. And I was like, and I'm about three hours over, okay? And I'm hearing everything like, my Lord. But this, it goes to show, though, when you raise people, young people, and they come in, become adults without a religious foundation or a God foundation, I should say, then you're raising a, 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 uh, a human tornado. They have no boundaries, no, no, no filters, no brakes. And uh, I do believe history shows us that whenever a, a country or society loses their moral compass, they're soon headed for self-destruction. And uh, I don't mean to preach to the folks tonight, but if the Bible's going to be going to be fulfilled, then we're going to experience a lot of craziness here in the next, I don't know, 25, 50, maybe 100 years. That's not a long time, humanly speaking. I mean, galactically speaking, universally speaking, uh, it's a short time. But now for us who lives are limited to three score and 10, maybe a little more, uh, that might seem a, uh, a long time. But universally speaking, that's not a long time. Even 200 years is not a long time, universally speaking. But we're headed into a downward spiral as history shows. Uh, that's my take on it. And, and, I, I, and I think also, you know, what religion gives us moral compass, but it also gives us a sense of purpose. And when people lose purpose, uh, direction, hope, Hope, um, you know, that's certainly something that Christianity has done for, you know, well, religion in general has done for people, you know, all over the world and speaking specifically of us, that's what it has meant for us. I mean, people, uh, you know, caught up in slavery and f from all signs, it's going to always be like this, yet they still had hope. Um, even, you know, civil rights days, uh, what I think uh, Dr. Pratt was talking about. Uh, but uh, I've, I've said enough other people may want to uh, jump in there. But, but uh, Thank yeah. You. I have a question. Um, and it's, it's not very far from his question. Uh, I, I have something I want to say, but I want to I wanna give you the question. What is the ultimate danger of white Christian nationalism? That's the question, but as that relates to the black church, the black church, in my estimation, has been in so many ways a moral compass uh, for the nation. Um, and, uh, and so when we see the, I don't want to call it the degradation of the church itself, but the way that we have so commercialized uh, the church and the ch moved the church out of the mainstream in the, uh, in the black community, can you tell us what, number one, what white Christian nationalism is mm -hmm. and the ultimate threat that it, uh, that it poses uh, as it continues to grow, particularly uh, uh, politically? Let me see if I can uh, recall, all, uh, um, you know, touch on, your, your questions and not miss too much. Uh, um, Christian nationalism, uh, white Christian nationalism, uh, you know, of course, it can, it can be defined in, in many ways, and I think sometimes people just use that label um, when they just don't agree with something. Um, they may disagree on some moral issue, and, and if the person is saying something, they say, well, you're a white Christian nationalist, whatever. But, White, there is something called white Christian nationalism, and that white Christian nationalism, in my uh, opinion, is interpreting Christianity through the lens of whiteness and uh, using Christianity uh, to assert one superiority over others. Um, and to me, the the greatest danger, if we're not careful, is genocide. Because if you believe that 
you are the chosen people of God and chosen to dominate others. God is on your side. And not only is God on your side, God is pushing you on, mandating that you do this. Then you can end up doing some strange things. You know, Hitler had his Christian followers. Uh, that was, what do they call that church in Germany? But that was that church in Germany that was uh, backing Hitler up. And you had all of those millions of people uh, being sent to the gas chambers and what have you. Uh, six million Jews, but there were other folks as well, um, uh, in, in, including people who were physically or mentally uh, disabled. Um, so, so to me, the, the, I think the worst is, 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 uh, is, is, uh, is genocide, but spiritual blindness in, in that people begin to call what is good, bad, and call what is bad, good, uh, because it, 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 it gets wrapped up in, it, it's about, I, mean, I had a colleague once and we were talking about uh, racism. He was a white colleague and I said, um, you know, we're talking about racism, I said racism is heresy. Heresy is a false teaching. Uh, it's, it's something that distorts Christianity. And he says, yeah, yeah. But he says, it's idolatry. I-D-O-L-A-T-R-Y. The worship of idols. It's making whiteness an idol. And I think it's both of that, but I caught his point. I caught his point. Um, and I think whenever you make an idol um, of anything, but, but certainly of oneself, then spiritual blindness, destruction of others. And, and you also turn people off from the faith because some people who are not Christian or religious anything can just look at that and say, eh, no, that's, that's not right. And if this is what Christianity is, I move away from it. What do you think? <laughs> Very quickly, uh, to illustrate it uh, is best this way. Um, white Christian nationalism takes the cross of Christ and wraps that, that cross in the flag. When the true relationship should be that the cross is what tells the flag how to wave. And so once we take the cross and wrap it in the flag, we use our own personal uh, judgments and our own personal thoughts to determine what right and truth are, and they have absolutely nothing to do with the cross. So that's, I know somebody else has another question, but... Um, but that is, in essence, uh, what, I, what I think about it. And uh, I see uh, the danger when the, uh, when the Speaker of the House has a uh, white nationalist preacher, pastor, uh, to pray yesterday. Uh, it is frightening uh, because he himself is a, I won't call him a white nationalist, but um, he is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. But when we think, when we think about the direction of this country uh, and the prevalence of white Christian nationalism, uh, number one, yes, it should make us go to the vote, uh, go, go to the polls to vote. Uh, and I know we got the we got the table outside here uh, for people checking their registration. But also, it puts a light back on the black church the importance and the centrality of the black church uh, as to, to be that, that center, that centering point. Uh, people like Jürgen Moltmann uh, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who spent, who these are uh, German scholars, uh, who spent time in this country uh, and, uh, and in their own personal writings, unprovoked by blackness, 
uh, would write things like they did, they, they lost hope in Christianity in America until they came to the black church. Uh, and for us to move away from it, for us not to give everything in us uh, to, uh, to see, to feel uh, what the black church is, yes, to us, it's our identity. John M.B.T. says that where the African is, there also is his religion. Whether we come or not, it's in us. But when we move away from it, we don't just move away from our center, we also move away from God. You see the, the, the advantage of teaching here, you, you get all of this information. You know, so, so, yeah. Then you can go out and brag and say, that's my student. <laughs> Um, oh yes, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ely. Hey, Dr. Dr. Martin. Uh, just, I guess, a quick question. Um, about thirty years or so, thirty years ago, uh, or so, I um, I was at a conference um, in um, uh, in um, uh, Cuba, mm -hmm. and uh, they, it was an evangelical conference. And uh, there were a lot of Jamaicans there. And what they asked me, they were curious. They said, well, why do you all say that um, you have a black church? Um, I also served on a, served as, as an associate pastor at a church with a guy who was a scholar. He actually taught at ITC. Mm -hmm. And he said, there is no black church. Just, um, just your thoughts. I'll leave it there. Just your thoughts about, um, and, and is there a distinction between the black church and black Christianity? There is a black church, <laughs> uh, I would say. And, and, and uh, by that, I would um, mean it's not so much that this is a this black church over here this is the white church over here and there's no connection, no similarity. I, I don't believe in that. But I do believe there are emphases that we have. There are things that we emphasize that are not emphasized as much over there. And there are some things that are emphasized over there <laughs> that we do not emphasize over, over, uh, over here. Uh, I, I think there is a black church because, again, uh, there is identity, there is a purpose, there is direction, and you don't really get that other places. For us as a people, you know, individually we may go and, you know, become part of another church and be very spiritually enriched and so forth. But as a people, as a collective people, we only get that here. Churches like you know, churches, uh, black churches. Um, so that that's that's what I would say. Um, is there a difference between the black church and black Christianity? Uh, Cut it off. <laughs> you know the old. Uh, did you want? Did, were you going to respond? No, to that? no, no, no. I was, I, it was just a question. It, it was. Uh, I think it's kind of like old, um, what, Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin talked about the visible and the invisible church. The visible church is what we see um, um, every day and, you know, uh, you know experience. The invisible church, uh, talking about the whole Christian invisible church, is what the church ought to be. It's those people or... Whenever we are doing what we are supposed to be doing, then we are acting in the invisible church, the church that only God can see. We might look at somebody and say, they ain't in the church. And they may be very much in the church the way God sees it. So I guess I look at it like that um, to kind of weasel out of this is to, is to say that black Christianity is that invisible church uh, what we ought to be, the visible church is our struggle to be that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the reason I asked that question, 
as I said, I served on, served as an associate pastor with mm -hmm. someone who was, you know, a scholar, mm -hmm. and he was dismissive of that, and you know, also being in, um, uh, being amongst people who who really question, you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I think that that is part and parcel because they had not experienced what happens here, mm -hmm. and also, you know, for him to dismiss the whole Albert Rabito and, mm -hmm. you know, James mm -hmm. Cone. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just, um, I was just enthralled why, you know, that was, um, that was the main theological premise uh, yeah, for this, yeah. this person. Yeah, that's kind of sad, yeah. yeah. To me. <laughs> Thank you. I should have noted that um, my mother-in-law's grandchildren, uh, Granddaddy's wife is here. <laughs> also, my wife, uh, Danita uh, Martin. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much. Would you hear uh, for 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 uh, for coming out and <laughs> and my Tukalu brother and sisters there, uh, brother Train and sister Train. So glad to see you. Uh, Long, long time ago, it doesn't apply to them, just me. Uh, they are recent, but long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, we, we were uh, classmates at Tougaloo College. You ever heard of Tougaloo? Black history, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I guess it's in Jackson now. Uh, when we were going, it was in the, I guess, the village of Tougaloo, but now the village of Tougaloo, I guess, is uh, incorporated in Jackson. Um, and I mentioned the church people there, Sister Bernice, Sister Brenda, Deaconess Dowdy. Um, Marjorie. Yeah, <laughs> Sister Marjorie, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Benny uh, is here. Mr. Benny is a member of East Friendship Baptist Church, yeah, yeah, in case y'all didn't know. And of course, uh, Deacon Sims and Dr. Dunstan, Diane T. R. Dunstan. And to kind of wrap it up, okay. <laughs> uh, and did I miss anybody from East Friendship? Thank you so much. Hey. Did Miss White back there? Yeah. Uh, is there somebody else? Make them identify themselves. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Dr. Sandy Martin. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I just, I, I want to put one, uh, one, one little tag on that black church uh, question of whether or not there is oftentimes we have people who bristle at uh, at just that moniker of a black church, uh, and uh, and th th there's a as Toni Morrison says, there's a kernel of truth in every lie. Uh, the kernel of truth there is that the the, bla the black church is not a monolith. Uh, there, there there are lots of different types, and uh, and and that's about as far as I would take um, uh, take the argument where there is no black church only in that way. But the spirit of the black church makes and demands a black church. And in fact, in this country, if there was no black church, uh, it would need to be created. Amen, flower. Amen. Um, so there, uh, as, we, uh, as we close uh, tonight, again, I want to thank um, uh, uh, Dr. Martin. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, he's probably got more papers to grade and other stuff to do, uh, but he decided to come and hang out with us tonight. Um, uh, now, everybody who came uh, all three nights, all three nights, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we told you that we have a certificate for you. This is the first time that we have done um, uh, the uh, Elizabeth Ireland Black History Lecture Series. Uh, it has been uh, far greater than anything I could have ever imagined, and I'm so thankful to all three, uh, uh, Dr. Pratt, uh, Dr. Berry, and, uh, and Dr. Martin. Uh, this, will, this is only the first time. That's why we have the, it is the annual 
uh, which means that put it on your calendars next year. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, but those who came uh, all three nights, we do want to recognize you. If you did come all three nights, please stand wherever you are, wherever you are, all three nights. All right, all right, all right. God bless you. Give them a big round of applause. And as we said, um, uh, Dr. Vincent's been working all day. We have uh, certificates for each of you. We won't take the time now, um, uh, but we're going to let people go so they can get home. It's 8.01, uh, and we are, uh, it's only 8.01 because doc, Dr. Martin took too much, I mean, he was, Dr. Martin was so deep, he was deep, he was deep. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much to all of my brothers and sisters from East Friendship Baptist Church. God bless you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we would all be remiss if we did not thank uh, Sister Martin for letting Dr. Martin come tonight. God bless you. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, please stand and we will pray out tonight. And to all of my colleagues from UGA um, uh, students, thank you so much for, uh, for being here tonight as well. Um, let us pray. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Eternal and everlasting God, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, because you are good. We thank you, O oh God, because you have brought us from a mighty, mighty, mighty long ways, and we ain't tired yet. We thank you for the gift, the presence, the power, the possibilities in the Holy Spirit. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of an Elizabeth Ireland who made sure that we did not just forget that she passed this way, O oh God, but she touched us in a mighty and marvelous way. We thank you, O oh God, for each and every one of those who have come out this week. We pray that something has been said, spoken, inferred that might touch their hearts in a way. Plant a seed, O oh God, that shall be nourished and it will grow. We thank you for the young folk who have come through. Be with them, O oh God. Allow those seeds to take root in them that they might grow and be strong. Thank you for the speakers this week. God, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Those who were here all three nights, come see me. I got something for you. One, one, one final announcement. One final announcement. Can I have everybody's attention? One second. And you can finish that conversation. I promise you. I promise you. Uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night here, this is, this is just for the brothers, but I'm saying it because I know that the sisters can go home and tell brothers on your way and when you get home. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here, there's an all-male worship service. It's brothers who are coming from Walton County, Morgan County, Clark County, Elbert County. They're going to be coming here for a all-brothers worship service at 7 o'clock, and we will have dinner uh, immediately following in the fellowship hall. God bless you. Get home safely.